That's it. It's here. That's my favourite song off the album, Temperate Climax by The Tropicals. And it's released. Can you believe it? We did it. It's finally out. If you didn't know, it's about... Let's say about four years in the making. (laughs) It was actually, I mean, two songs were recorded a long time ago, actually before I even joined the band. And, um, And then another five were recorded with me and the other guys. And yeah, and we recorded it all and we mixed it with a guy in Melbourne and then um, we were planning to release it in, I think, July 2019, yeah, and the guys said, look, because I was planning to leave for Europe and the guy said, James, wait one extra month, leave in August because then we can release the album and have a release party while you're here and then you can go to Europe. So I was like, all right, I postponed my flights, you know, waited an extra month and almost a year later, <laughs> it's finally released. So yeah, we didn't have a, a launch party then and we're not having a launch party now. Well, they might, but, um, but yeah, it's finally out and yeah, I thought this episode would be a good time to talk about it. Um, firstly, I've just got a slightly different setup here. Normally I have a table in front of me, but I thought I'd try and do it without the table this time. Maybe I can focus more on the camera and try not to dart around the room so much, but I do have to look at some stuff on the screen because I've got notes and whatnot. Um, but yeah, so head over to the band camp. Um, you can see it on the screen now. We put it on Bandcamp and it was on Friday because um, Bandcamp decided that they were going to do, uh, like all their proceeds were going to charities. And forgive me for forgetting the name of the charity, but it's, um, it's you know, it's for the cause of uh, racial justice, and um, which is pretty relevant at the moment because of the whole Black Lives Matter movement and everything. And we thought it would be appropriate to donate to them. So... Yeah, any money we make for it, like we've got some small bills that we need to pay, but anything extra we'll donate to that cause as well. And all of the money that um, that Bandcamp would receive for that is going to charity. Um, but that's already finished, that, that uh, promotion. Um, but yeah, still, like if we make profit from it, we'll donate that as well. So yeah, if you are feeling ge- feeling generous, go over there and and purchase it, or you can just listen to it on the the website if you want, and let us know what you think. Because yeah, it'd be cool to see you know which songs people like, and and um, yeah, it'd be cool to see how it goes. But yeah, personally, that that one there, Fake Bamboo, is my favorite at the moment. But you kind of jump between favorites, I guess. It's also kind of weird to have like a favorite song from your own album, but. You know, we make the music because we love it and we just hope that other people do. So I don't think it's a crime for me to have a, a favorite of one of our songs. <laughs> um, but yeah, so check that out. Um, yeah, and I thought I would talk a little bit about the process of making the album because that was my first time ever recording a, an album. I keep saying album and I don't know whether to call it album or EP I guess it's kind of an EP because it's our first re- release. Um, but I think the Arias technically, my guitar teacher told me that Arias consider anything with more than six songs to be an album or to qualify for an album, it needs to have six songs. So it is kind of an album. It's a, it's a short album, but technically it's an album. Um, but yeah, I'd never recorded something like that before and I've never really released music in a, any kind of official way before. Um, but yeah, it was an interesting process. Anytime you're working in a band, you've always got, you know, you've got a bunch of different thought processes and a bunch of different opinions that are kind of all trying to come together. And most of the time we agree on things, but, um, you know, there were some things that I kind of had to take a step back from because, 
I have particular ways that I like to do things and, um, you know, in the end, like, um, the, the two guys that like started the band had a vision for how they wanted to do it before I even joined the band. So there were some things where I was like, okay, I wouldn't do it that way, but that's how they wanted to do it. And, you know, I still like how it turned out. So yeah, it was good. But, um, yeah, it's sort of this battle between, um, like I, I work in the music tech industry and, and I'm very much into like being progressive with technology and trying to improve on things and try to like, essentially I'm a, I'm an advocate for digital music and, and, um, the digital sort of, um, workflow, I guess. And these guys wanted to have more of like a, a vintage sounding vibe, which I think we got, which was nice. But, um, yeah, I would have done some things differently, but it, it ended up being good. Well, we're happy with it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's kind of, I don't know if, if it's a concept you've heard of before, but there's like a, a thing called wet or dry mixing. Like some people prefer to, I can't remember which way it is. Like it's either like, like it's the difference between the American music industry and the British music industry, but I can't remember which one likes which, but it's basically like, um, do you record everything clean with no effects or anything? So you have like a, a base level, um, recording that's really, really clean and, and you can always refer back to that. And anything you add on top of that is non-destructive and it can be undone and you can adjust layers of effects and stuff uh, at any stage and you can always go back and change the the sounds of things and stuff whenever you want or do you go the route of um putting things through like analog equipment and permanently baking effects into the tracks as you record them or like as when you say i want to apply this effect like a reverb or something to it um, you know, sending audio out into the reverb and then back and recording that in. And now that's the audio, like that's your blank audio. You can't undo the reverb. You can't adjust how much reverb was on there, um, because it's already done and it's kind of baked into it. I personally prefer the first option, um, which means generally that you're using all digital effects and the other guys prefer the second option, which is where you're using more vintage analog equipment, um, which, yeah, I guess the value of that is that, um, you can tap into some sounds that might sound familiar from older tracks. Um, but the disadvantages of that is once you've done it, you can't undo it. So you can tend to lose quality or you can use inf lose information over time. And if it's not done right, then um, you sort of degrading each, each at each step, you're great degrading the audio a little bit, but I don't think we had any major problems with degradation or anything that there, there were some noise issues and stuff that we had to fix, but, um, but yeah, it turned out in the end, but that's a bit of inside baseball, like <laughs> just so you can understand the, the kinds of things that, that were going on and the decisions and stuff we were having to make. Um, and yeah, but it was an in interesting process. Basically the way we did it was we all went into a studio together as a whole band and we had a, a recording engineer there and the idea was to, is to do drums first. So you're all playing your instruments with headphones so that, um, none of the guitars or anything are getting picked up in microphones and you just microphone, you just have microphones on the drum kit and, um, yeah, so we recorded drums for all of the tracks and then we went away and actually recorded the rest of the stuff on our own because it was just like, you know, sitting in the apartment, plug the guitar into the interface and we, you, we could spend as much time as we want recording as many times as we wanted. And we made like this makeshift vocal booth out of like couch cushions and mattresses against the wall and stuff and like blankets draping over it where we could put a microphone stand inside. And, um, yeah, we recorded vocals that way 
and yeah it was a it was a fun process i think that was the the enjoyable part for me was hanging out in lester's apartment and um yeah taking turns of going in this shitty vocal booth and um and you know whenever whenever whoever wasn't busy recording or whatever was hanging out on the the balcony that was a good time i got lots of good memories from that the initial recording session i guess was a little bit stressful because you're paying for for time and yeah i don't know some people really like that because you know you're getting a professional job but you know that like you have to get the job done that day or otherwise you have to pay more money so that's kind of a stressful thing in the future i think if i was to do it again i prefer to do like all of the recording with our own setup um and then i think just pay somebody to mix and master it because um you know the guy in the studio is pro probably has a better idea of how to set up microphones and stuff but i feel like when you're not in the studio you get a little bit more luxury of time to mess around with that stuff and you get to do some more takes to make sure that things are right and um you know you can add some extra elements to things without running out of time we had one thing where um one of the songs the guy the other guys this is another difference between me and two of the other guys they were really insistent on being like um you know let's do everything um just natural like let's just play the song how we would play it when we play live and i was like i really think we should be playing with a a metronome in our headphones like a click track to keep us in time and the reason for that is because i knew i was going to be like editing and and comping together a lot of clips a lot of different takes and stuff afterwards to try and like get the best sections of each recording and yeah it's called comping i guess it's like a normal part of uh music production um <laughs> So we did one take of each, each time. We did one natural one and one with a metronome. But there was one song where we just ran out of time and we only did the natural one. We didn't have a metronome. And lo and behold, um, the, you know, the reason why I wanted to use a metronome is because we knew what tempo was right for each song um, because we tested that out before and played, played the songs through many times. And yeah, lo and behold, when we recorded the one without a metronome uh we went through the process of tracking all the other instruments and then in the end when we were getting ready to go back into mixing everyone was listening to it like it's it sounds good but it's a little bit too fast <laughs> and it, it was kind of unanimous like yeah it's it's just that little bit too fast and i'm like well that's because we played it at like you know whatever it was 100 and 16 bpm when it was meant to be like 112 or something um but it was no biggie we were able to fix it and re-record some stuff to make it work but but yeah the i guess the reason why that happened is because um i think it's mostly because we were kind of limited with time and especially when you're like a you know when you're an amateur kind of band and you don't have a lot of money to be putting into this sort of stuff you don't have that like freedom to just be like all right if we don't get it all done today we'll just do another session tomorrow plus the guy that we're working with also is quite busy and he had a lot of other projects he's working on so yeah so i think in the end um if i were to do it again i would just dedicate the time to setting up a space and getting borrowing equipment if you if we have to and and setting up somewhere where we feel comfortable and we have plenty of time to record everything and rather than tracking all the drums in one day i probably would have taken you know three or four days to do it and make sure we get it exactly how we want it and try out some different variations and stuff and then you know do the same thing with the guitars and then then you have all of the recordings you own them you know you you have them all originally as they are and then with that you can do whatever you want like if you you can take them to somebody to mix and then if for whatever reason you weren't happy with that mix you can give them to somebody else to mix or you can give them to somebody to master or whatever else but yeah that would be my, be my advice to anyone 
going into it. Not that I want to take money away from like recording studios or anything, but um, if you have the money to do it, by all means do it. But if you're strapped for money and you're strapped for time um, and you want it to be a bit of a more relaxing process and, and even though, you know, you don't want to give yourself excuses to take ages to do something like you don't want to set all this up and then end up taking three months to record your drums just because you've you've got time um, but if you can give yourself that bit of time if you are strapped for cash then yeah it makes makes life a bit easier and i think in the end um the fact that we didn't do that probably ended up costing us more time because then we had to fix things afterwards and fixing things afterwards takes a lot longer so yeah, give yourselves time in the beginning to record stuff exactly how you want it or close enough, close as, as you can get to exactly how you want it. And then everything afterwards becomes a lot easier. Um, but yeah, we, yeah, like I said, we got it all done. The guy we worked with was super, super good with getting a, a nice tone from the, the drums and everything. And, um, yeah, it has, a, it has a good vibe. I'm happy with how it sounds. Um, what else? Is there anything else to say about that? I don't know. Yeah. Basically, that was that's all of the process. It was really, yeah. We spent a day in the studio. Then we spent maybe two weeks tracking in Lester's apartment. And then I spent probably like the four weeks locked up in my bedroom with a spreadsheet of all the things that I needed to do to each track to get them ready for mixing and just spend a bunch of time comping everything and all that kind of stuff. And then, um, yeah, that we took it to, um, back to the original guy to mix it. And then after about a year and a half, <laughs> we finally got everything sorted enough to, uh, to go to somebody to master it. And that was it. And then we fucked around with album art as well for about two months <laughs> and finally got to something that we were all happy with on that. And now it's finished. So what a relief. And yeah, I'm proud of it. And I'm proud of all the guys that were involved in it. And, um, yeah, I hope people like it and I look forward to doing something like this again. It was, it was a cool learning experience. Um, but now I guess, that's enough on that. I'll move on. Big news this week. Big news. EA Games is making Skate 4. Fuck yeah. We've been asking for it for so long. And it's happening. It's finally happening. It's one of those things like... Um, I don't know if you've ever been into like video games and stuff like there was this myth for ages that Half-Life 3 was going to be released and that was like 10 years there was all these like conspiracies and videos on YouTube and stuff and it never really happened but then they made this new one recently but Skate 4 has been like this cult thing where there's all there's been all these petitions and big things on you know social media and stuff of people trying to hype up like the the d yeah trying to generate hype for ea to make a new skate game and like there was always depressing um news articles saying like oh the main developer who used to work on the game like no longer works for them and he works for another company now and there's really pretty low chance that it would that they would ever make a game again and then you finally like get to the point where you're like you come to peace with it. You're like, okay, they're never going to do it. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere at some, you know, random press conference when they're talking about new game consoles and stuff, they're like, oh yeah, and we're going to make Skate 4. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> sick. Um, so that'd be awesome. Hopefully they do it on PC this time. If not, I'm going to have to just buy a fucking PlayStation or whatever. Uh, what else? Today I got some stuff in the mail. Um, if you saw my Instagram post, you might have thought I was a fucking lunatic. Because I bought... Um, well, firstly, I got some replacement parts for one of these microphones. I'm going to do a video about this soon. But basically, this is like the old version of this mic. And 
it has this really janky mounting thing that I made because it broke and I had to like put a bolt in there and shit. But it's because that mounting system was way worse than the one on this. So I bought some, I got some parts. This is super boring, but I'm going to make a video about how to upgrade that if you're interested in that. Uh, and I got some bike parts and shit like that. But the funny things that I got were, oh shit. Um, I bought a dishmatic, like a, you know, like a plastic stick with the sponge on the end and you can put, um, detergent in there. And I bought a flat bed sheet, just a single flat bed sheet. Well, not a single like size, like a queen size, um, flat sheet. And you probably thought that's ridiculous. Why would you buy those things on Amazon? And the reason is, and I've discussed this before. You just can't buy shit like that in Germany for, I don't know why. Like, like I, I said this about mops, like there's, they don't sell mops in Germany. Like people just don't use mops. Like they have those flat scrubber things where you have to like peel it off the stick and like wring it out with your hands when you want to clean, clean it stuff. I don't know why you would want to do that. But, uh, yeah, so they don't sell the the dishmatic thing and I went to a linen shop the other day right and I'm like I'm, I'm sick of this shit every time I go to you know if I go to like Ikea or something I'm like I don't know why they never have like full sheet sets you know like a normal sheet set is like um, a fitted sheet a flat sheet and two pillowcases I thought that was standard and um, yeah they only ever have like fitted sheets here so I went to a linen shop and I'm like, sorry, you, excuse me, do you speak English? She's like, yep. And I was like, see these sheets, right? These ones are fitted sheets. Yep. Uh, do you have any that are not fitted? And I'm like pointing to the word that, that means fitted. And she's like, uh, no, no, we don't sell those here. I'm like, All right. So do you know where I can get something like that? And she's like, oh yeah, yeah, try this shop. Like up the street, like they sell a lot more linen and stuff. Okay. So go in there, find the girl that's working there. And I said, sorry, excuse me. Do you speak English? Yeah. Yeah. Um, these, uh, fitted sheets, right. But do you have any just like normal flat sheets? No, we don't sell those here. Look. All right. I guess they just don't exist. You must have to go to like a super bougie place to buy it, but it's like, that's the normal sheet. <laughs> and this brings me into like, uh, this is one of those things where you know, it's like one of those divisive arguments, like pineapple on pizza, like flat sheets or no flat sheets, uh, or top sheet or no top sheet. I'm totally in the top sheet team, team top sheet, because it's like, uh, you know, if you don't have a top sheet, I get it, right? Like it's easier to, um, to not like mess up your sheets, but you have to like, Every, anytime you want to clean your bedding, you've got to take the cover and you've got to take the blanket outside of the cover, which is, you know, reasonably difficult. And then once you wash it, you've got to put the blanket back in the cover, which is extremely difficult and fucking annoying. It's like, for me, I think about it like in countries where you have to have, um, where it's like snowy in winter. So you have two sets of wheels for the car because one set of wheels, you have the snow tires and the other set of wheels are like your summer tires. But, um, you change the whole wheels, right? Because to change a wheel, all you have to do is take off the, the nuts, take the wheel off, put the new wheel on, put the nuts back on. But if you were to change the tires instead of the whole wheel, you have to like peel the tires off the wheel and, um, and then get somebody to put it on like a rotator thing where they press the tire on, like it's way harder than doing a bike tire or something. They have to like press the tire onto the rim and then they have to use this like thing that blasts air into it so it like separates the tire and attaches it to the rim and then you can inflate it and stuff and then once you do that you've got to like balance the wheels so that it doesn't vibrate when you're driving so they have to put these little weights around the wheel and shit it's like so much effort right so for me taking the cover off the blanket is like replacing your tires off the rims every time it goes from summer to winter like so much extra work that's just annoying <coughs> Corona. And, um, 
Yeah, I guess people always think like, uh, you know, if you use a top sheet that you're like wanting to be super neat, but using a top sheet is more effort, but it's not like the whole reason why you use a top sheet is to save effort because when you want to clean your bedding, all you have to do is take your top sheet and your bottom sheet off and wash them. And you don't really have to worry about the blanket cover because it's not, it shouldn't be getting dirty because it's protected by a sheet. So that's definitely the easier option. It's way easier. <laughs> and also like, um, I don't know what's banging around in here. Uh, also, if you want to, um, like if it's hot, right? And it's too hot with the blanket on, but you don't want to have nothing on, like it might be too cold with nothing on, or you just want to have something covering you, or maybe there's like a mosquito in the room or something. So you want to have a sheet. You just want to have a flat sheet to put on you because it's not hot, but it's still something to cover you. <coughs> and I was like, what do you do if like, I said this to some people I know here, I'm like, what do you do if you just want, if it's hot and you want to be like that? And they're like, oh yeah, I just take the cover off the blanket and just use the cover. Firstly, like before, that's so much extra effort, pointless effort that's annoying as fuck. And secondly, then you've still got two layers because it's like the top and the bottom of the cover. So that's annoying. But yeah, I just don't get why people want to spend so much extra effort to do something like what, just so that they they don't, their sheet, they don't have a sheet that can like, I don't even know what's the, the big deal. But um, I get it, like people, when they roll around in their bed, the sheet gets mixed up in the blanket and stuff. But also, learn how to sleep. <laughs> you know, just roll around under the blanket, like don't pull the blanket with you, and then you don't have any problems. Like, just learn how to move in the bed. This is, a, this reminds me of, uh, I would always have this argument with two of my friends I used to live with. And we would argue about, um, whether or not you should, you should supposed to put butter in the fridge. And, uh, my argument is that it belongs in the fridge because it's a dairy product. Like you don't just leave milk in the cupboard because that's disgusting. It would go off. And they would always be like, no, but you got to put it in the, the cupboard because if you put it in the fridge, it's like hard and then you can't spread it on your toast because like it puts holes in your toast and stuff. It's like, firstly, this is like the extra, extra soft butter, which is like that so that it's easy to spread from the fridge. And secondly, it's like, at this point, it was like, you've been alive for 25 years, learn how to make toast. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like get some bloody finesse about you. Learn how to use your hands. Like don't fucking chop into the bread, just spread it across, you know? <laughs> 25 years and you haven't learned how to spread the butter yet. Come on, pick up your game. Haven't learned how to fucking sleep. Haven't learned how to fucking spread the butter. Unbelievable. What have you been spending all your time on? I don't get it. <laughs> Important skills to learn. And yeah, then there's tomato sauce in the, in the fridge. Like I, yeah. I know you don't want the tomato sauce to be super cold, but it's meant to go in the fridge. Like there's no, there's no argument. These last two things about the fridge, the butter and the tomato sauce, there's no argument because if you read the, the fucking packaging, it says on there, keep refrigerated, like very plain, very obvious. It's like when open, keep refrigerated. That's what you're meant to do. That's what you do. And th this is like, uh, it's like the toilet paper argument. Like, are you meant to put the toilet paper? over or you meant to put it under like against the wall obviously you meant to put it over and there was you know there's this stupid argument people think you meant to put it under or whatever and then somebody found like the the original patent for like toilet paper or toilet paper holders or whatever and it has a picture like a diagram showing that it's meant to go over it's like there you go case closed finished no argument it says on the source keep refrigerated it's meant to go in the fridge i'm sorry Something I can do. My hands are tied here. My hands are tied. 
uh, yeah. But um, yeah, that, so that's my stance on those three things. Hope that divided uh, my uh, audience. Come on, absolutely trump on this country. Dividing everyone up. So, team top sheet, team butter in the fridge, team tomato sauce in the fridge. I'm team coriander. Oh, I missed toilet paper. Toilet paper over, team toilet paper over. Team coriander, as in coriander is good. Or coriander is people are allowed to eat it. Because <laughs> I guess the other argument against that is people are like, coriander, that's disgusting. You can't eat it. And it's like half the world eats it. Anyway, but I think it tastes good. And then the last one we've got to address is pineapple on pizza. I can't remember if I've made my stance on this before, but um, here's the thing, right? Pizza, where did it come from? It comes from Sicily, which is in Italy. And how did it come about? Basically, it's like, um, you know, you have, you have all your meals and stuff during the week and all the food that you bought during the week and it gets to Sunday and all the stuff that you got from across the week that's left over or that didn't all get used or whatever, you got to use that before you buy stuff next week. Otherwise things will start going off and you waste food or whatever. So what people started doing was they make a dough, flatten it out, put some tomato paste on there, grab everything that, you know, was about to go off or that they needed to get rid of and just chuck it all in the dough, you know, spread it all out evenly, put some cheese on there and put it in the oven and that's pizza. And <coughs> definitely Corona. And uh, yeah, so the idea was it could be anything. It could be meat, it could be vegetables and it could be fruit. But the thing is, right, pineapple isn't native to Italy. And, um, you know, pineapple comes from South America or whatever, but it is a fruit, but more likely in Italy, it would have been things like grapes or like sultanas or whatever that would have ended up on pizza. The, that's the kind of fruits that they would have had. So technically, yes, it is allowed to have fruit on a pizza according to how, you know, the tradition of pizza began. So technically, yes, pineapple on pizza, you, it works. And practically though, if someone puts a pizza in front of me that has pineapple on it, yeah, I'll probably eat it, but I would never order it because it's shit. <laughs> it's just a bad flavor combination. Like who, who would think that pineapple is going to taste good with tomatoes? It's just a bad idea. Like, there's, it's not like, are you allowed to put fruit on a pizza? Yeah, you can do fruit on a pizza. I'm not, there's no judgment on that. It's just, I'm just, it's a questionable combination of fruit and vegetables though, because, yeah, I don't know, it's just gross. <laughs> but I'm kind of in the middle on this one because I still eat it, but definitely wouldn't preference it. And um, actually, it seems more common in Europe for people to like flat out dismiss it, even like pizza shops. Like um, one of my mates from work was saying that he ordered a Hawaiian pizza and um, everyone in the pizza shop, like the guys working there and all the people like eating pizza all looked over and they're like, ooh, Hawaiian pizza. <laughs> oh, pineapple. It was like they put pineapple on there. But um, he said that the pizza tasted really bad and he's like, I hope they didn't do something to it because <laughs> they were like offended that he ordered pineapple on pizza. But yeah, I don't know what the Italians think about it, but it it's definitely not a traditional Italian thing. Like putting a fruit that comes from South, a tropical fruit that comes from South America on a Mediterranean dish, you know, it's like... Um, it's yeah if you if you're like a it's culturally it's a sin i would say <laughs> it's like uh what's another traditional food like you wouldn't put lychees in a spaghetti bolognese or something right like they're just to two completely different worlds and 
completely different flavors. Like, doesn't make any sense. Uh, what other pointless shit can I rant about? <laughs> uh, let's go into uh, my favorite segment, life in Germany. And it's another day in beautiful, rainy Berlin. It's pissing down rain and windy outside. Um, life in Germany. Today, I wanted to talk about a word, a German word. Oh, it's a kind of two words, maybe, but... But, yeah, I think somewhere along the line, like, the English language, right, we have to pay credit to Germany and we have to pay credit to France because English sort of stems from Germanic and French language stems. Um, So we have a lot of words in English that come from German and we have a lot of words in English that come from French. And um, the thing is, I want to talk about the word glove, you know, like something you put on your hand, because I think somewhere along the line, there must have been a word for it in German, but I, for whatever reason, maybe somebody got drunk and forgot it and then stopped using it. But now, instead of glove, they call it a hand shoe. Makes sense. It kind of shoes for your hands but come on like glove it's not that hard (laughs) surely you could have a one syllable name for it um or something a little bit more unique than just a shoe that goes on your hand (laughs) but apparently it's the same in dutch apparently they say hand shoe as well because i was talking to one of the guys from work about it a dutch guy um but yeah hand shoe so i i don't know i find that funny I'm thinking that uh, I'm just going to start adopting that onto like any piece of clothing. Just like going to the shops looking for some shorts and just be like, uh, yeah, have you got any, um, some leg shoes? They're like what? I'm like, uh, actually, sorry. I meant, um, like the, the half length leg shoes, like the, just the short leg shoes. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? I'm like, oh, well, I mean, I've got my shoes and I've got my torso shoe. But I need some, I've only got long leg shoes, so I need some short leg shoes. <laughs> Fucking stupid, I don't know what I'm talking about. But yeah, I thought that was funny. Like I pictured, um, you know, ha- uh, like there, there must have been, well, according to this Dutch guy, like there is an old word for gloves, which means like a fancy glove or like uh, like a gauntlet or something maybe. But somewhere along the line, like, that disappeared somehow. Like, I I like to picture somebody sitting in a bar and, you know, they haven't spoken with, like, civilization for a long time and they're telling somebody a story and they're like, oh, yeah, and then I had to, I had to take off my, um, uh, you know, like the hand shoe. You know, I forget what it's called, but anyway, we'll call it hand shoes. I have to take off my hand shoes. <laughs> it's like, you know, how did that disappear? Like, how did they go from having a specific name for it and then just decide to call it, ah, it's just shoes for your hands. <laughs> Bloody Germans, eh? Gotta love them. Um, talked about mops. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's enough about Germany. Corona update time. Um, so, I skipped an episode last week. Um, before last week, the episode before that, we were at 7 million cases worldwide. And then last weekend, I checked the numbers, but I didn't do an episode, and we were at 8 million. Steady growth. And now we're at 8.8 million. So, we're almost at 9 million. So we got a steady pace, still cracking. Um, and here is the bad news. I've been harping on this thing about um, about the rate of the daily new cases, like the rate of change of new cases worldwide, and how we were. You know, at one point it kind of stabilized at like 125,000 new cases per day. And then 
some restrictions and stuff started easing off and it started to climb again. And then who knows what caused it. Maybe it's just more relaxed restrictions or people getting more relaxed about it. Or maybe it was because of hundreds of thousands of people riding and, and protesting or whatever. I'm not saying that that's what it is. Maybe it's because people started playing sport again. I don't know. I'm not the one to say it. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with protesting, but I am saying that there is likely to be consequences from that action. Um, so yeah, it's gone right up. We're at 181,000 new cases per day. So definitely at the peak right now, like it's only gotten more and more intense. It's only grown more and more. It's only started spreading more and more every single day. And now we're at the worst that it's ever been. And the, most of the restrictions are like almost completely relaxed and everyone's back to their normal life, regardless of the fact that the number of cases per day has pretty much doubled since like the time when we were in full shutdown. So it's interesting, you know, I don't know if the data is correct and I don't know if the actions that governments are taking is correct. But what I do know is that, um, from the looks of things, the situation is not getting any better worldwide. I got to say that. Um, but like, if we look at, uh, let's look at where it's bad. So who's got the most daily new cases It's Russia at the moment. And it's been Russia, Pakistan, and Mexico in the top for, you know, three or so weeks. Um, yeah, it's been consistently getting bad in, in Russia and Mexico, especially. And if you look at the, who's got the most daily new deaths, it's Mexico. I think Mexico is a lot more population dense than Russia. Obviously Russia is huge. And, um, they do have a big, a large population, I think 110 million people or something, but it's a bit more spread out. Obviously there's a lot of people in major cities, but Mexico has a big problem. Let's check how individual countries are going. And like last time, I'm mostly concerned with America, Australia, and Germany, because I think that's where the people listening are. Um, so America, we just want to see the daily new cases. So America has spiked again, but not as high as it has in the past. So yeah, things have gotten bad again, but, um, it's not as bad as it was, but let's see if this continues to grow because the, the protests were about two weeks ago. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Let's see what happens. And yeah, I gotta say it again. I've got nothing against the protests. Like, uh, yeah, I agree that there's no right time to protest about something, but you know, this is a separate issue. And I'm, I think it would be crazy to think that, uh, that there's no link between the protests happening and spikes in coronavirus cases. So, uh, yeah, to ignore that would just be silly. Let's check Germany. Okay, we've stayed pretty low in Germany, so that's good to know. Um, looks like we've had a little bit of a spike. I did notice most of the people in the protests were wearing masks. Um, so I don't know how, how that affects it or if anyone from protests is getting sick. But yeah, there is a bit of a spike, but it's nowhere near as bad as the States. And let's check Australia. Australia seems to be pretty good still. Cases are way down from the peak. And maybe there's a little bit of a spike, but it doesn't seem like it seems pretty normal. So well done. I'm sure I'm sure New Zealand is like oh New Zealand has zero, I think. Maybe I can check that. Yeah, their total new cases is just like it's flattened. So they're doing really well. I guess that's, that's like an ideal situation is get to the point where nobody has it and then keep the borders shut and, and, uh, yeah, there's no, you know, there's nothing that can happen, but then at what point do you open things back up and, you know, I don't know, whatever, but Jacinta Ardenza boss, so she's killing it. 
Uh, I actually kind of want to wrap this episode up soon. I, I think I want to go for some shorter episodes. Um, so I'll do some housekeeping. Yeah, like I said, I skipped a week last week. Like I, I want to, I'm wanting to do this every week regularly, but, um, you know, we released an album on Friday and I had a lot of stuff that I had to do for that. So I just thought, you know, I could do a late episode on like Wednesday or something, but also I was crazy busy with work and I'm like, nah, I'll just, I'll just leave it till this weekend and I'm doing it now. So, you know, it's not like I was going to continue to just go, ah, I'll do it next week. I'll do it next week. Hopefully it was just that one time. Um, but yeah, I'm trying a different setup here without a table because firstly, like I said, I want to focus more on the camera because I end up looking down at my computer a lot of the time. Um, I'm still looking at the ground now, but, uh, also I want to like streamline the whole setup. So actually I want to have like the camera closer and, um, recording directly into my computer and all that stuff. So, yep. I'm improving the process bit by bit and I'm in the double digits of episodes now. So, you know, I guess like the first 10 episodes is kind of just feeling out whether or not this is actually something I can do. And like I've said a bunch of times, I'm not, you know, pretending like I'm trying to become like a famous podcaster or something. It's just something I felt like I was interested enough in doing for a long time and I'm doing it for the fun of it and for the experience. Somebody actually, I got to admit this, somebody commented on one of the episodes and it was, they just said something like, why do you even bother? <laughs> and it's a good point. You know, why do I bother? There's like, compared to all the other, um, YouTube channels and stuff, like this has got very few views and very few subscribers and whatever. But, um, I don't, I don't really care about that. Like it's, I'm just doing it for fun and you know, there's a few people that like hearing updates from me, like friends and family and stuff. So I'm down for that. And also, yeah, like just getting some practice and getting better with editing and, and setting up recording and stuff. So I'm happy to just keep doing this. That's why I'm doing it. Uh, and yeah, if you listen to all of the other episodes, you'd know why I bother because it's just something I want to do. And you might think this is shitty, but I deleted the comment. <laughs> And normally I would think like, yeah, I wouldn't want people to delete comments. You know, people hate the idea of like, um, when like famous YouTubers delete hate comments and stuff, but I just did it because like, I know that I don't have many people watching this and I don't have many subscribers. And that particular video only had one comment, <laughs> which was this guy saying, um, why do you even bother? And I'm like, all right, well. I would be happy to leave this here if there was like, you know, one other comment that was like, oh, nice work or whatever. <laughs> but I didn't want it to be like the only comment was being like, you're a fucking loser. Look, like the fact that nobody else has commented on this is proof that you shouldn't even be bothering doing this. But yeah, whatever. You know, maybe you got some enjoyment out of making that comment, but I just deleted it. Okay. Sue me. Um, I'm doing this because I want to, that's why I bother. Uh, and I think now that I've done over 10 episodes, I'm feeling a little bit more confident with it. And I think I want to start doing some like interview episodes, like, um, chatting with just friends of mine, or, uh, even some of the guys from the band have mentioned that they might want to do like a video call because they're in Australia and I have a way to do that. I want to, I'd want to do it in a good quality way, not just like recording a Skype call. Um, so I just got to put together some like instructional video and be like, okay, we're going to do this podcast together. I need you to do this, 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 and this is how you're going to send me the files and blah, blah, blah. And if somebody's cool to try it out, then maybe I'll try it next week or in the next coming weeks or whatever. But if not, I'll just keep doing it like this. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to try that out as well. So that'll give me uh, a, a new experience as well to try some episodes with somebody else. Um, okay. Uh, my recommendations for this week, I've got some music recommendations. Can you guess it? 
It's Temperate Climax by The Tropicals. <laughs> Check it out on, Band, on Bandcamp. Um, I'll put a, a link, obviously, um, in the description so you can find it. But, um, yeah, if you give that a listen, I'd really appreciate it. And more importantly, like, let me know what you like about it. What songs do you like or, or whatever? Um, because, yeah, it'd be good to hear some, some feedback on it. Because actually through Bandcamp, oh, the other guys can see, but like, I can't really see any of the, the, um, data or analytics or anything. Cause I'm not logged in, but, um, I can ask the other guys about it. But if you let me know stuff about the music, that's, I would like to hear that as well. And shout outs is the last thing I want to do a shout out to, um, Jack and Alex. Um, Jack's my sister's partner. Um, they just sold their flat for more than they, they sold it at auction for more than they wanted for, wanted for it. So that's awesome. Congratulations. Um, I bet they're celebrating pretty hard right now. So yeah, shout out to them and that's it. I'm going to end it there. Uh, how do I end it with this button? All right. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to check out the album. Don't forget to ask me stupid shit. Like, why do I bother doing this? <laughs> And I'll be sure to delete your comment. Alrighty, catch you later.